So we are uh, given the title Deep Brain Stimulation from Referral to Outcome. We heard just now a fantastic account of, uh, by Amy Bell, Belladonna. <laughs> That's her name. I start with uh, this lady called uh, Virginia Apgar, who uh, is on a US stamp. Uh, in 1953, she is an anesthesiologist, and in 1953, she introduced uh, the so-called Apgar score that is performed on every single baby who is born just at birth. And this is to evaluate or to give a score of the well-being of the baby at one minute after birth and then five minutes. And as you see here, it's a score between 0 and 10, assessing skin color, pulse, respiration, reflex, and muscle tone. With the baby is uh, uh, normotonia, hypotonia, hypotonia, or atonia. So muscle tone is very important from birth. Uh, yesterday, we heard some uh, history. I just want to mention that neurosurgeons, or functional neurosurgeons, have also been aware of dystonia and try to, uh, to, to, to treat dystonia by surgery. This is Irving Cooper, a uh, neurosurgeon from New York, and this is a magazine from 1967, Decade of Medical Marvels, where uh, they show a boy who has uh, incapacitating symptoms of dystonia musculorum deformance, who was operated with thalamotomy. And these are digitized videos from uh, that era, showing patients with generalized dystonia, mobile dystonia, who have been operated with either thalamotomy or pallidotomy, which is a lesion heating area of the brain involved in the dystonia. And we see them before surgery and uh, after surgery. So neurosurgeons have been aware of this condition and tried to help with uh, the surgery at that time. But the modern era was started by uh, two, two, two neurosurgeons. One is uh, Philippe Coub in Montpellier, who was the first to do DBS on generalized, uh, patients with generalized dystonia, and uh, Joachim Kraus from nowadays Hanover, but at that time he was in Bern in Switzerland, who was the first to publish on uh, DBS for uh, torticollis or cervical dystonia. So before the referral, we need a diagnosis, as we heard. And before getting the diagnosis, we need to understand the symptoms. So from symptoms to diagnosis, and uh, we heard yesterday about the doctor's awareness about dystonia. And as I said yesterday, it's not only the GP, it's also a general neurologist who need to be aware. So there is a time frame between symptoms and diagnosis that can be between months to years before the patient gets the proper diagnosis. And this paper, uh, uh, in this paper, the authors have interviewed patients about their life shift after DBS, but starting from the, the beginning of their symptoms. And uh, they quote one of the patients who was interviewed saying, to obtain the diagnosis, several medical consultations were often required. But then, eventually, after the diagnosis is set, it can take years or decades before uh, the patient is referred by the neurologist, by some neurologist, to DBS. So the issue of getting a referral for eventual DBS was perceived by individuals as a struggle or even a fight with their physician. And in the same paper, they write, the process toward referral was experienced as drawn out because of prestige and sometimes a lack of knowledge from the physician about DBS. So to quote one patient in this uh, paper, uh, she said, uh, I pushed him to write a letter. He said, like, go back to school, you will feel better, you keep yourself occupied. And this was not a GP, this was a, neuro a general neurologist. So eventually, the patient is referred, and from the referral to the evaluation, it usually takes no more than maybe a few months. So the patient can be evaluated if he or she is suitable for deep brain stimulation. Thank you. So once the patient received the diagnosis of dystonia, is referred to DBS team for assess the suitability for deep brain stimulation with a whole workup which has to be done. 
why DBS? Why speaking about DBS? Because uh, usually dystonia is an unremitting movement disorder, and usually and mainly when it's of childhood onset, it will spread, it will go to our generalization, as it was precised uh, in the previous talk, uh, mainly in children. And it is responsible of increasing disability over lifetime, and no uh, efficient pharmacological treatment is available, with a few exceptions, as for example, for uh, dopa-responsive dystonias, and often there are a lot of side effects related to medical treatment, and only in focal dystonias, botulinum toxin injections will provide a sufficient effect. So deep brain stimulation is a symptomatic treatment, meaning that the same approach will be offered to different con conditions, uh, which will exhibit uh, similar but also sometimes very distinct phenomenology uh, related to movement disorders. The most important questions which, are, uh, which uh, have to be questioned or asked in front of uh, patients uh, with dystonia is in whom deep brain stimulation should be applied first. Which symptoms will respond to deep brain stimulation but also when is the, uh, the best time point to offer this treatment in a given patient. So once the patient is referred with a diagnosis of dystonia, usually uh, we'll start, we have to start with the confirmation of this diagnosis. We have to make sure that it is a patient with, who is really presenting with dystonia, which can be seen as a typical case, uh, as presenting with patterned, twisting, repetitive movements, as in the, in the right arm in this patient with a TOR1A mutation, a gene mutation related DYT1 dystonia. Uh, this young lady at the time of referral presented also with abnormal postures that we can see a little bit later in the video when she will, when she will sit with severe dystonia in the neck, trunk involvement, but it involvement also involvement also of the limbs. So these abnormal movements are associated with abnormal sustained postures, but also with other features as, for example, um, sensory tricks or also uh, with some uh, task-specific uh, symptomatology. So related to dystonia classification, which was very nicely and in detail presented yesterday, uh, dystonia is classified at the, the current classifications will address to a patient at a given time point. But we are in front uh, of dynamic disorders with phenomenological changes over time, clinical worsening, new symptoms, and in some cases also from a normal imaging we will go uh, towards ra radiological alterations which will trigger or will po point out a given uh, uh, identification of a given cause. And the cause, unfo unfortunately, is, cannot always be documented at the time we offer deep brain stimulation uh, treatment in patients with dystonia. So the most suitable approach is the syndromic approach, where we will ask which, is it dystonia? Is it an isolated movement disorder or combined with other types of movement disorders, as for example, myoclonus or uh, Parkinsonism? Which is the prominent uh, movement in this syndrome? Is it a complex dystonia where other neurological features or extra neurological features will be associated? And which is the pattern of evolution? And is it imaging contributive or neurophysiological data in order to final, finally validate the diagnosis? And for example, in the case of this young lady with DYT1 dystonia that I presented previously, only to describe these different steps, it is a childhood onset disorder, isolated, generalized form and persistent, uh, inherited in an autosomal dominant and related to a mutation in TOR1A gene. In patients with dystonia, there is not only the motor aspects which will um, cause uh, difficulties to the patient. There are also non-motor features as pain, sleep alteration, cognitive impairment, psychiatric comorbidity, fatigue, which will all, 
all be responsible of disability and limitation in daily functioning, which has to be taken into consideration at the time we're discussing uh, uh, brain stimulation, since all these uh, complaints are not accessible to this treatment. Another interesting aspect uh, in patients with dystonia, that one given disorder, one given disease, the same cause, will uh, be responsible of, um, of very different phenomenology, sometimes even in the same family, as for example in these two videos, where you can see a grandmother and the grandson. It is also a DYT1 family ca coming from Sardinia where the, f uh, the, the motor, the clinical phenotype is very different if the grandmother um, presented initially only in childhood uh, with an involvement of the upper limb and later in uh, adulthood a cervical involvement as well. The young man presented with a childhood onset dystonia the, the, with very severe skeletal deformities, a generalized form, and the question is, is it the same tra treatment? We will address the same treatment, and which would be the appropriate time to provide this therapy in these two cases? So why clinical phenomenology is important? Because it is a key factor which will guide the therapeutic attitude if for, for medication, but also for the brain stimulation indications. So at the time the patients are referred for the brain stimulation, uh, we will focus not only on motor symptoms, but also on function. And there are different available scales in order to assess the amount of the movement disorder, to quantify it, but also uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to assess uh, impairment, disability, and functional alteration related to these uh, motor symptoms. And usually videotaping is used in order to, uh, to document and monitor evolution under treatment. Etiology, the cause of the dis different types of dystonias is very important because it will provide some, inf uh, some valuable information about the evolution of the disorder, but also based on ex accumulated experience, prognosis with deep brain stimulation level of the, uh, and level of the expected response follow the, following this treatment. So I will not enter in detail about the classification, but the current system will address uh, dystonic uh, syndromes uh, according to two axes. The first one, based on clinical characteristics related to the age of onset, the distribution of the symptoms of, over the different body parts, the temporal pattern of the evolution of these symptoms, and also the associated uh, features, which was previously mentioned. And the second axis will address etiology with the type of inheritance, evidence for acquired forms of dystonia, as for, for example in perinatal brain injury or trauma or drugs administration for, followed by dystonic features, but also by uh, neuropathological data in order to provide arguments in favor of, structure in, of structural lesions or de degenerative disorders. Which kind of dystonia? Again, etiology. Two examples. The first, the first picture, uh, uh, the first MRI, uh, documenting a quite typical uh, uh, aspect of the sequela of perinatal hypoxic brain injury with lesions in the posterior part of the motor uh, contingent of uh, putamens, but also at the level of, uh, of thalamus as here, and the second one provides arguments in favor of a neurodegenerative disorder with accumulation of iron at the level of the target, which is the internal globus pallidus, in a PCAN patient. Imaging is contributive not only to document, to validate the cause, the etiology of the dystonia, but also to prevent surgical indications in patients with uh, dystonic or with abnormal cervical postures, as in this example, where you can see a men meningioma at the level of the foramen magnum, so it is not an indication for, of course, uh, functional neurosurgical procedures for this abnormal posture. But 
uh, together with the imaging, with the clinical examination, the phenomenology of the movement disorder, is also, also details of the medical history are important. In this young boy who was uh, referred to our department for deep brain stimulation uh, for hemidystonia, we received him with a diagnosis of stroke. The child was born in Romania, he's still living in Romania, and uh, uh, early at the end of his first year, of age, uh, he presented an episode which was diagnosed um, as stroke and uh, with an MRI which was compatible with a sequela at the level of, of the right striatum. But when we went through the history and uh, the mother explained uh, us uh, the, 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 the story, how it happened, we realized that uh, symptomatology and time frame of the events were not compatible with the stroke and finally it came out that it is a metabolic disorder order, it was a glutaric aciduria. So history, it's really important at the time the patients are referred for the brain stimulation. So when we sp sp speak about the brain stimulation indications, when there is a ter medical therapy refractoriness, when symptoms are severe enough to produce disability, and when patients are presenting with uh, uh, painful muscle spasms. Uh, in contrary to the, to, to the indications uh, for Parkinson's disease, there are no validated criteria for deep brain stimulation in dystonia. And there are no predictors as, for example, the level of DOPA challenge in Parkinson's disease. Another issue is that there is no uh, a real cutoff related to symptom severity, which where we should set the threshold and to, 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 to decide this patient has to be uh, operated because it's severe enough. So it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing um, unsolved issue. And also there are very challenging aspects when we are discussing indications for deep brain stimulation, mainly in acquired and progressive dystonias. Now it's again the turn of <laughs> Professor Harris to go ahead with the surgical issues. Okay, before I continue, I would like to say that uh, at least at Queen Square where I worked and also in Sweden where I worked before, this evaluation is done together with, uh, into, into a multidisciplinary team. Uh, proper function and neurosurgeon are not only technicians. We don't uh, uh, work like the neurologist come and say, put an electrode in this place. Thank you very much, I'll put it. It doesn't work like that. It shouldn't work like that. So this discussion, because we learn as a neurosurgeon, I learn a lot from the evaluation, discussion, meeting the patient together, sometimes several times, to understand the disease we are operating on. So finally, the consensus is that the patient is suitable for deep brain stimulation and for the usual uh, brain target uh, that I will uh, describe here. When I came to the United Kingdom in 2003, I had already operated for 10 years in Sweden, patient with dystonia, starting with pallidotomy and then deep brain stimulation. And in the uh, UK, I operated the first patient in 2003 and in 2006, I was looking at the Dystonia Society brochure, the UK Dystonia <coughs> Society. Your questions answered. Is there an operation that would help me? And the, the, the answer was, surgery is only rarely used for dystonia, and it can be disfiguring and may produce unacceptable side effects. I have never seen a disfiguring surgery for the dystonia. So this is the United Kingdom Dystonia Society at that time. Uh, they have changed their mind now. So surgery, we have to prepare the patient. So after the multidisciplinary clinic, we meet the patient again to explain the surgical risks that are very low, fortunately, the infection risk, which is about 2%. Uh, we use general anesthesia, the stereotactic frame, we can show it to the patient, uh, MR imaging, the electrode, we show them, uh, and then uh, I will go through uh, the rest here. Again, I personally, and uh, most neurosurgeons, stress, we have always, patients have always hope, but we have to keep this hope realistic, not only of the patient, but also of the family. So the expectation should still stress to be uh, realistic. Uh, 
So the DBS, as everybody knows, consists of the uh, electrode. This is the one we use with the narrow, narrow uh, uh, space between the four contacts. This is one of the brands, of the oldest uh, brand. Now we have three companies that provide uh, DBS hardware. They are, have all their pros and cons, but the surgical procedure is the same. It doesn't matter if you put any of these electrodes or even if you put this thing in the brain. It's the same, uh, the same uh, way to do it. So we have uh, general anesthesia on all patients. It was not the case when I did pallidotomy, which was a lesion. The patient uh, had to be awake. Uh, stereotactic frame you see here, uh, MRI. And you can see the great variability. Here I give you two examples of the anatomy. On the left side, you have uh, uh, primary uh, uh, generalized dystonia. And uh, you see a big pallidum here. You see the subdivisions of the pallidum, putamen here. And look at this pallidum. This is sclerotic uh, and, and, and very thin of a post-anoxic dystonia. And both these patients have been operated. So the anatomy, uh, that MRI now with a proper sequence, like this one can show, can show you exquisitely the details of uh, the individual patient. So we don't use the atlas, although the atlas is good to, to know the anatomy when you read about it. This is uh, another patient where you see the atlas here. The area is, main area is the pallidum. We have to be aware of what is around it. The, a motor capsule here, the optic tract here, the amygdala here, and you see it mimics quite nicely the uh, image here. And then the main target is the pallidum, the posterior part and the inferior part of the pallidum, which is the motor area. But occasionally you can put electrode in the motor thalamus or even in the subthalamic nucleus uh, uh, in some special condition. But the main validated and established target in the brain is the pallidum. So surgery is done, uh, as I said, asleep. Uh, at Queen Square, we have the privilege of having an MRI machine in the operating room, which makes things easier. Uh, we don't use micro recording. We use uh, impedance uh, monitoring. You see, this is the electrode on one side, and uh, we have the radio frequency electrode that does attract in the brain. You don't hear it here, but we hear the impedance uh, uh, sound, and then this is replaced by uh, 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 the DBS electrode. It's a very safe electrode in uh, proper hand and without using multiple trajectories and micro recording. Postoperatively, immediately we have uh, MRI, and we used to have MRI immediately, even when we didn't have MRI in the operating room, to verify that the electrodes are exactly where we wanted them to be, to verify on different scan, uh, axial, uh, horizontal, and uh, vertical, that we have reached the point that we have to reach, that the electrode coincides with the target, so that the preoperative target is in red, and you see the electrode behind. It's not always the case. Sometimes we have to correct the position of the electrode. We can even, with a stereotactic post-operative uh, MRI, see where each contact ends up from the posterior and most uh, uh, down ventral part up, up the four contacts, up to the level of the ventricle here. That will help uh, in programming the stimulation. The patient wakes up now. So the prognosis following the brain stimulation is related, as I mentioned previously, mainly to the underlying disorder. And usually there is a good maintain of the clinical benefit over time until 20 years and even longer in isolated and com uh, combined dystonias. However, there is some var variability at the beginning in the initial outcome, at the initial steady state, but also in the long term maintain of the clinical benefit. Uh, within the pallidal target, which was described by Professor Harris, there are some mild uh, side effects related specifically to the target as bradykinesia and or some gait impairment, but which is in phase, which will be phased uh, to the control of the dystonic features and sometimes um, uh, of severe symptoms as, as, for example, dysphagia. One issue with the brain stimulation can be the rebound of the uh, clinical symptoms at the time of DBS interruption in some patients, 
And also another uh, uh, important information which has to be del delivered to the patients and to their families at the time that DBS is offered, that is sometimes some mild or moderate disease progression can be observed under, um, under the treatment. Rarely tolerance to the brain stimulation has been reported. So which are the, the, the main points of the brain stimulation in dystonia? A very positive effects on the phasic component versus the tonic component of dystonia, but not exclusive. Associated movement disorders, as for example, subcortical myoclonic jerks, are very well controlled by the pallidal stimulation, symptoms that uh, signs that are sometimes associated, for example, in myoclonus dystonia syndrome. The effect uh, is uh, obtained uh, following deep brain stimulation in generalized forms, but also in more limited segmental uh, dystonias or focal dystonias, as for example, cervical dystonias. And uh, it can uh, be, the effect can be obtained in uh, syndromes of moderate severity, but also in life-threatening conditions as, for ex as status dystonicus. Which will, which will be the specificities, specificities uh, of debris stimulation and of programming in patients with dystonia. One difficulty, one issue is that the clinical improvement will not occur immediately, within minutes or within hours or uh, within days, as it can be seen in some of the motor features in Parkinson's disease or in essential tremor. The clinical improvement will have a monotonic course over weeks or even over a month, which will parallel this clinical improvement, the correction um, of the physiological uh, 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 abnormalities, abnormalities which underlie the uh, pathophysiology of dystonia. The most efficient uh, at, um, way to stimulate patients with dystonia in the globus pallidus is the monopolar stimulation and usually uh, using high frequency. There are some limited experiences also with lower values for the frequency, mainly in order to avoid some side effects. Which are the factors of good prognosis when we are proposing uh, the brain stimulation in patients with dystonia, isolated dystonia, so uh, uh, named also primary dystonia, patients who are presenting a mobile uh, phasic component for, for, the movement for their movement disorder, a short disease duration, the, the absence of skeletal deformities, and no associated pyramidal tract impairment or other neurological features in acquired forms of dystonia. Failures related uh, to, to the brain stimulation and to indications to selection of patients, complex forms of dystonia where other neurological signs are associated, progressive disorders, mainly metabolic disorders, uh, the, static, the, the static forms with uh, severe structural alterations that we can see, for example, in hypoxic brain injury and also sometimes related to the phenomenology of dystonia, for example, in rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism. Cranial in, uh, involvement, speech involvement, usually are less improved than other symptoms. Complications related to the brain stimulation, the most frequent complication is infection with a higher rate in pediatric population, uh, mechanical complications related to DBS device as electrode or extension cable fracture or migra migration of the devices. One other complication, the failure to, to respond to the brain stimulation, but also insufficient effect which can come from the discrepancy between objectives and outcomes, and also, as Professor Harris mentioned, between expectations of patients and their families and, and the medical team. One other uh, important issue 
even if it's rare, is tolerance to the brain stimulation. The previously mentioned side effects as bradykinesia, which is more frequent in adult populations. The dependency on devices, now with the rechargeable system, there is a need of uh, some educational issues and, uh, and training in order to, uh, to assure the, the continuity of, of the therapy. And also, in some patients, rebound of dystonia when DBS is discontinuated. So I will let Professor Harris to summarize for the surgical issues. So, uh, yeah, so as you read here, the patient with dystonic symptoms need to be recognized and referred to movement disorder specialist, not any neurologist. I, I insist on that. And medically refractory disabling mobile or tremulous dystonia need to be referred to a functional neurosurgery team. <coughs> so in summary, DBS is the main surgical treatment for dystonia but pallidotomy and thalamotomy may still have a role. And there are uh, reports, including uh, <coughs> from our, our center, where a patient who had a severe infection, had a complete rebound, a status dystonicus was, uh, the status dystonicus was uh, stopped by a unilateral pallidotomy. We did that a couple of times at uh, Queen Square. The posterior ventral pallidum is the main target DBS is better for primary than secondary, as we heard. It's better for mobile than fixed dystonia, better early than late. Uh, realistic expectation is very important, and the patient needs support and care postoperatively. It's not only to put it and uh, program it. Uh, there is a reorientation in life. We'll hear more about that, uh, hopefully, later. And sudden failure of DBS, there is a risk of dystonic crisis in some patients. Uh, is this yours or mine? This is yours. It is ours. <laughs> so objectives depends on the type of dystonia, etiology and phenotype. The objective must be defined and validated together with the patient and the family. Complications are related mainly to the deep brain stimulation system and the treatment interruption. And DBS has to be seen as a lifetime treatment dealing sometimes with progressive disorders. DBS administration requires a multidisciplinary team to select the candidates, identify reasonable target symptoms, perform the procedure, cope with complications related to therapy and devices, and optimize the brain stimulation administration. We would like to thank for your attention, and I would like to thank the organizers. I'm really pleased and honored to be here. <laughs>